One of the most infamous shootings took place in Whitechapel in the 1960s, when gang culture was at its height. Do you think anybody will ever be as big as the Chrysler? No, never. Twin brothers, Ronnie and Reggie Cray, rule the East End with intimidation and violence. Fear played a large part in it. And I think this is because they always did what they threatened. They went away 30 stitches. Well, they're animals, really. I'm on my way to meet three brothers whose lives were changed by their association with the craze. They are Bobby, David, and Alfie T. Their mother owned a local nightclub, and the brothers became close to Ronnie and Reggie. Alfie, you were the one who introduced the brothers yeah. to the craze. Yeah, How did, did that happen? got to know him, he called me over, he said, said, come over and meet him. Hello, boy, how are you? Yeah, yeah it's all right, good. So he was very friendly? Yeah. Who's my hot fella, me, That's how he talked. And he, he used help. to speak like that. A lot of people have got the impression that clubland, London, is very tough. When all clubs you get an occasional drunk, you know, and sometimes they have to be slung out, and that's why there's dorm in there. Ronald, what do you think about Clubland in London? Well, I think most clubs are very respectable, you know, and uh, I don't think there's any trouble at all in them, except occasionally. Bobby, what were your first memories of meeting the craze? Amazingly friendly, and I thought, well, you know, they're obviously villains because most of the people we knew around that area were villains. So, but you, a villain is a different thing than a killer. Yes. Bobby's life changed in 1963. When Ronnie Cray shot and killed rival gang member George Cornell in the Blind Beggar pub in Whitechapel. After the killing, the gang convened here in Walthamstow. David, what are your memories of that night when you came here for the first time? What was that about? Reggie Cray, he phoned up me, he said, the Colonel wants to see you. Ronnie was called the Colonel? Ronnie Cray was called the Colonel. And when he said he wanted to see you, you had to Absolutely respond? Absolutely, everyone. If he said, be there, you've got to be there. Otherwise, he'd send someone around and he'd drag you around there. So, and we went over there, and I said, what's happening? So Reggie jumps in the front, he said, get off the manor, lively. He said, well, he's just, he's just shot Cornell, he's just killed Cornell in the head. Best thing, he said, dead men can't speak. Who said that? Ronnie Cray said, the best thing is, dead men can't speak. And there's one thing you couldn't do, is go to the police. Because by the time you got to the police station and walked out, Ronnie Cray would know. They would, they would know. So you're saying to me that the Crays had people on the inside in the police? Yes. All the time. hundred percent. Quiet, squad. Yes, just a minute, I'll put you through to him. In the 1960s, Scotland Yard's flying squad fostered close relationships with criminal informants. Hello, Vicky. Got some information for me. For some officers, this meant crossing the line, taking bribes, turning a blind eye, and tipping off criminals. The Teal brothers felt trapped when the Crays, anxious to avoid their regular haunts, insisted the gang hide out at David's family home. I think there must have been at least 12 of us sleeping on the floor in, 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 the one, room. in one room. There was guns being bought in. And it was. You know, and, and shot yeah. guns and... Uh... Well, Ronnie continued to chicken scratch his list of people he intended to kill. He took one of my kids' little books and he started putting names. So Craig compiled a list of the people, people to be killed. Who's going to be next? On your daughter's colouring book. In my front room. The siege continued for several days, and Bobby, the eldest brother, began to make a plan to get his family out of a critical situation. When did you begin to think that you couldn't allow this to go on forever? Uh, there was a couple of things happened that really put me on a track that I had to do it. I had to do something. 
One was when Ronnie was over on the Isle of Wight, there was a party going on. And basically, to put it in a nutshell, he said we were going upstairs to the party and it was nothing to do with a party. He planned to rape me and he did. But I think the icing on the cake to the whole thing was when he made a move in David's flat on my younger brother. There was the key decision. Yes. That was it. The decision Bobby made would lead to his leaving the country and not returning for over 40 years. In the 1960s, Ronnie and Reggie Craig were London's most feared gangsters. They were, in this country, what the old star Chicago gangster was in America. See, they started a fashion of murder, terror. There's only one man I know that did retaliate, but they got him in the end, and they cut him to pieces. I've come to the Stoke Newington area of North London with Bobby Teal, a one-time associate of the Craze. After Ronnie Cray murdered George Cornell, the twins insisted on using this flat as a place to lie low. Bobby's brother David lived here with his family. Bobby, let me take you back 50 years ago. What are your memories when you, you come back to this place? A little horrific, to say the least. This How so? Is, well, the actual smell inside that, build, that house was just amazing in terms of the sweat and the booze and the cigarettes and I was quite terrified. So you were in an atmosphere which reeked of crime. What did you think of doing? I could see where this thing was going and I thought they dragged us into this. We are now literally accomplices. Someone's got to do something and so I made an excuse to Ronnie to say I had to go and see my mother and that's when I made the decision to get in touch with Scotland Yard. Although he knew that the craze had connections inside the police force, Bobby made his way to a public telephone. So this was the phone box from which you made the call? Yes, I believe it was. I made the call and I asked for a Mr. Butler. At the time, Tommy Butler, famous for apprehending the great train robbers, was investigating the craze. He asked me, what do I know about the Cornell murder? And I said, considerable amount. He said, well, we need to meet. On that day, Bobby Teal became an informer, secretly meeting Scotland Yard detectives under the code name Phillips. He would often give information to his handler as they drove around in unmarked cars with Bobby hiding on the back seat. I just had no idea how it would end. I knew and was totally convinced I'd never get out of it alive. Did the craze at any point suspect that the name Phillips or the code name Phillips was associated to an informer? Totally knew that it was the informer. But they didn't know who Phillips was? Didn't know who Phillips was. Uh, uh, did you have any idea? I didn't know Trevor till two years later. By the time Alfie and David discovered Bobby's secret, all three brothers were in prison. They say Scotland Yard framed them for collecting money with menaces to keep them safe from the craze until it was time to testify. But this has never been proven. The 34-year-old twins, Reginald and Ronald, came here early this morning with flying squad officers. They were found in the ninth floor flat in a skyscraper block which is occupied by their mother. The whole operation has been one of the most closely guarded secrets of Scotland Yard's history. The Crays were convicted of the murders of George Cornell and Jack McVitie. Even in prison it's feared that the twins might order men's deaths. So prosecution witnesses are still guarded by the police. Bobby, after the trial, you left and had no contact with your brothers for 
many, many years. Why was that? As soon as my guards were removed and they said, you're on your own now, I said to myself, I have to get out because now I'm a target to everyone. Bobby fled Britain and settled in Canada. Believing that the craze still had influence and connections, he never dared reveal his whereabouts, even to his own family. Then in 2012, over 40 years later, David found his brother online. How did you control your emotions knowing that you had kept this distance from your brothers after all this time? Well, the first thing I did was cried for a few days because I did everything in the power that I had to block it from my mind for 40 odd years, never dreaming that I would ever see him again. And I thought, okay. It must have been extraordinarily difficult. It was extremely difficult, yeah. But it's got to be understood that when the young kids put these people down as heroes, they were the lowest of the lowest. Yeah. I hate to regret that I even set the eyes on the craze when bullies, the biggest bullies on the planet. In the years after the craze were convicted, several bribery and corruption scandals involving flying squad officers were revealed. I'll see you at 9 o'clock tonight. In 1977, 13 were convicted on charges of corruption, including the squad's commander. Over the years, our police force has had its fair share of controversy. And one particular focus has been the issue of race. What have you got there? We're putting this proper, we're sussing us. Because we're black. Look, I don't care if you're black, white or purple. Seventeen percent of the Metropolitan Police Force is now made up of ethnic minorities. But until 1967, there were no black or Asian officers. I'm on my...